and I commend it to the House. I call Lewisa Wall. Uh, tēnā koe te māngai o te whare. Firstly, can I Kia congratulate you on your appointment uh, as an assistant speaker in this House? And I actually want to reflect on that just briefly because we have a Pākehā man uh, as our speaker, we have a, a Pākehā woman as our deputy speaker, but we have a Pacific woman assistant speaker and a Māori male uh, assistant speaker. So if we wanted to look at a representative uh, a, a speaker um, you know, a speaker list, I think we have it, and it, it's actually worth noting. I don't think anyone else has really paid tribute to the diversity that we have, um, because I think your job is incredibly important in making sure that we undertake our role uh, as members of parliament uh, in this House in a, um, in, in a way that manages and ensures we all contribute constructively. Uh, secondly, I'd like to acknowledge all the new members of this parliament, um, a lot of you. Uh, I want to acknowledge your maiden speeches. I think they were an outstanding range of maiden speeches and also really highlighted why each of us is here representing our particular uh, electorates, uh, our communities of interest. Um, and I think this bill in some ways speaks to those communities of interest. Um, I am a previous member of the Justice and Electoral Select Committee. I want to acknowledge uh, Sarah Dowie, who chaired that committee, and also Chris Bishop, who is a member of that committee and is obviously also uh, the author of this particular Members' Bill. I've got a lot of respect for Chris uh, because he does bring to the House uh, issues that do need legislative reform, and he does it in a manner I believe that uh, allows all of us to contribute to what is a, a discussion um, that some may see trivial, but actually within the context of a lot of the, the kōrero that we've heard today about freedom of expression, uh, about uh, freedom um, uh, or balancing those freedoms with, I guess, the role that the films, videos and publications classification act actually has. Uh, which is to, I guess, moderate and to look at content related to books, films, videos and other publications and whether or not uh, they are, I guess, material uh, that should be available in the public good to the public. And that, in essence, has been a lot of the discussion we had with regard to this particular piece of legislation. Because the reality for um, the, um, the committee, the reality for us as uh, New Zealanders, was that there was a process that banned a book that, when I looked at the plot summary of Into the River, was, and I quote, set in New Zealand, the book tells the story of Māori youth Te Arepa Santos as he moves from the east coast to Auckland to boarding school where he, has, where he has encounters with intimacy, sex, drugs, racism and death. Now, none of us would have ever imagined uh, that a story that uh, provided, I guess, an opportunity to look at uh, a young person moving from uh, the east coast, rural New Zealand, uh, to Auckland would create a situation where it was banned, and it was banned for six weeks in New Zealand. And I just want to walk us through uh, how that happened, because in fact, uh, in September 2013, Ted Dawes into the river was classified unrestricted. So would have thought that was the end of the story. Uh, pretty much it was for mature uh, audiences suitable for those 16 years and over. What happened um, in uh, December 2013 uh, was, in fact, uh, Family First appealed that classification. So they went to the Film and Literature Board of Review, and so in December 2013, the classification went from unrestricted to an R14, and there was a really curious thing happened, uh, actually. The president... Um, Don Matheson, QC, actually had a dissenting view. He said it should have been classified R18. And so it wasn't. It was, uh, it was, it was classified R14. And everyone would have thought, OK, let's move on. But it didn't, because in August um, 2015, library, uh, librarians around Auckland, because there was such a huge demand on the book, uh, actually appealed and in August 2015, the book was deemed unrestricted again. And so you've already had, like, unrestricted, 
R14, the dissenting voice said it should have been R18, unrestricted, and then Family First appealed it again. And what happened in that second application by Family Four, First, they also applied for an interim restriction order. And it was that part of the process that then uh, effectively banned the book, because under the current legislation, when there is an interim restriction order imposed, then you can't supply or distribute the publication, and you cannot possess or import the publication for the purpose of supplying or distributing it. And therein lies where we got the ban. And so what this piece of legislation will do is make sure that uh, when interim restriction orders are being put in place, when there is an appeal, that one of the tools available to uh, the people who are responsible, the Film and Literature Board of Review, they can actually say, in the interim, we're going to give it an R14, which it had, or an R18, whatever it may be. But essentially what they're saying is that it should still be available. And what we highlighted um, in the legislation to people of certain age, to people who belong to a certain class, such as tertiary students, and people should be able to access the publication for a specific purpose. And we noted that it may be a film festival, obviously not a, it's not relevant to a book, but the reality is this piece of legislation is providing another tool in the toolkit that will ensure books are not banned. And that's something to be commended. I think that that's an incredibly, um, it, it's a great contribution actually to lawmaking because I um, personally um, think that uh, when we have people like um, you know, our author Ted Dawes trying to uh, engage with particular cohorts of young people, this book, I remember uh, a lot of discussion about it, it was about um, providing a genre uh, and an opportunity for young people to have discussions about intimacy, sex, drugs, relationships. And in fact, I did look at Family First's um, kind of rationale for that second appeal. And what they said was it wasn't just about the book. What they were preoccupied with, uh, with was about a benchmarking the censorship office and setting, I guess, what's appropriate. And from their perspective, uh, things that had adult themes such as uh, sex, uh, that had sexually explicit content and bad language, they thought should be restricted to that R14 kind of restriction. And I guess therein lies the discussion and debate within society about when is a young person a young person? You know, at what age do uh, our young people have access to information through story, through narrative, which is real life, uh, real life um, examples of how our young people navigate those particular issues these days? how they navigate growing up, how they interact with uh, their peers, how issues such as uh, you know, engaging in, in relationships that involve sexual um, ex exploration, about having uh, the opportunity to drink alcohol, um, and those other things that this book actually provided. So for us to clarify uh, that books such as this, as this are valid and that they have a place, and while we're kind of going through a bureaucratic process in some ways, um, Madam Speaker, uh, that they shouldn't be banned, as I said before, I think that this really provides a good example uh, of a member's bill uh, that if it's crafted in the right way, if it's brought to the House in the right way, actually will get the support of the House. And that's one of the other things I want to highlight, is that throughout the select committee process, we all... Um, deliberated collectively. Um, it was lots, we, we did have lots of questions, believe it or not. Some people will think that this bill was very small, but actually we had lots of great discussions. And, and it's one of the aspects of this House that I think we underestimate, that there is an opportunity for us to collaborate, that there is an opportunity for us to work together. And from my perspective, this piece of legislation provides a really good example of how uh, collectively we can make decisions uh, for the public good a as a parliament. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well I call Chloe Swarbrick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I am pleased.